All right, we're going to teach you how to do the transducers, wide beam and then the chirp and uh, the removal of the old transducers, the installation of the new and what the difference is and why you need them on your boat. Now, obviously, this transducer right here, I'm going to put my hand here for reference as to the size of it. It's not, it's not going to be easy to get that on a trailable boat. Just like a sound system or a concert, whatever, the biggest speaker wins. I've shown you the chirp transducer. That's several frequencies in one. And then here's the old one. This is typically what everybody's upgraded to in the 80s, 90s, and the 2000s. Um, this is a really good transducer that we took out. Uh, your boat probably has one like this or smaller. And you can see with my hand how big it is. And just like an antenna on your radio, the biggest antenna receives the most in power and has the most gain for the signal. These transducers are no different. There's a ceramic piezoelectric element in there and when it gets excited by electricity, it'll oscillate and it's designed to oscillate at its own harmonic fixed frequency. And that's how that echo travels out and comes back and then the machine can differentiate between seeing if that frequency is compressed or if it's stretched and that way they can tell if the fish is coming closer or going away uh, the signal strength of it which indicates density and um, not just for fishing but treasure hunting navigating anchoring this these transducers do a lot of work and they're pinging thousands and thousands of times a day oftentimes years on end these are the old transducers that we took out. So let's give you a little size comparison here. This is what you probably have on your boat. And this is a wide beam unit that we're going to put in. Super low frequency. And uh, you can see it's not much bigger, but it is, you know, about 60% larger. So then if you put this one over here, up on this one, this is the transducer from here to here. This is the fairing block. On this one inside here in the encapsulated molding are several transducer staves just like this. The transducer elements and that's how they get all the different frequencies out. And the way this is working is, is your depth sounder is putting out 50 or 200 kilohertz. So it's basically deep water or shallow water. And that's great, but everybody else, number one, is on those frequencies. Number two, um, there's a whole range of conditions that occur between the top of the water and the bottom of the water. So if you have thermoclines and um, radical temperature changes, um, different structure on the bottom, mud, silt versus rock. Um, you know, there's several different type of things where if you had maybe a wider variety of frequencies, like instead of 50 and 200, let's say that you have 40, 50, 60, uh, 80, 120, 200, and 260. You see what I mean? It's just the processors and the computers are now more sophisticated so they can process more of that data and keep those frequencies all separate from each other so they're not colliding into each other and, and making the element, uh, you know, one frequency's interfering with the element's reception of the other frequency. So that's what they've all worked out here and did, these are all made by Airmar. It doesn't matter if you're buying Raymarine or Garmin or Icom or uh, Zimrad or Furuno, you're going to get an Airmar transducer. And selecting the right transducer is not all that easy. So you're probably going to need some help with that. 
not to mention putting it in. Now, how did we get these old ones out? Well, really, they, they get a lot harder. You can see here, this white stuff's the old 5200. They didn't really use that much. They were basically just trying to get a water seal here, relying on the bolt up here, which is in the front, a long brass bolt, to keep it from swerving around in the current. Okay? You can see the guys had to pound on it a little bit, but if you start pounding on this stuff, it oftentimes doesn't come out. So, but you have an opportunity to try it that way, but then when that doesn't work, you have to drill it with a hole saw from the bottom. And I oftentimes recommend that right away. And then for whatever reason, the guys don't do it. They want to try to beat it out. But if you, like for this one here, you can see this and estimate how thick the stem is, like out to here. So if you put a hole saw, put a piece of wood in here for the pilot bore, to go into to center you up and then that hole saw was cutting around here all you would have to do is cut 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 and then all of a sudden this whole thing falls out and then you knock this piece off that's a much easier way to do it but you can see my guys are they wanted to try it the old-fashioned way and this time it worked for them I when I take them out you won't see these types of pounding but they're young strong men they can they can do it that way it's out that's the main thing it's out I'm going to show you we're here on the bottom of the boat now this is a 60 foot one off uh, male mold construction foam core composite it's a super thick hull it's about 5 eighths of an inch glass laminate on the outer side of the foam and another half inch or more on the inside and then other laminates on top of that so uh, you need to get a long stem transducer for that and uh, so check your part numbers out and make sure you don't order the short stuff now you can see where we took a basically in order to get that off we took a sawzall and we have a guy over here hold a big board and the blade starts over here and it bends over the top of that board and then the other operator gets over here and they bend the saw down this way and the blade has an arc to it and they start at the point and they just follow down and cut it all the way off otherwise it would take days and you can see there's no damage or blade marks at all it just tracks in the 5200 and the soft plastic uh, that's the path of least resistance so it doesn't dig into the hole once you keep both ends of the blade out so this will have to be cleaned up with some 80 grit and then some 150 and some 220 some primer and um, and prep it for the marking of where the two screws are now going to go through the hole to keep the new transducer on uh, the other one only had one and we'll have to also measure the angle of this slope which is how we have a limit of 22 degrees and make sure that we're within tolerance of our slope angle and then cut the fairing block so that we null out as much hull angle as we can making the net result that the transducer when the hull is fixed at the dock Without any motion, the, whole, the transducer would be pointing straight down to the bottom. You can see our keel over here, not far away, but far enough away and shallow enough where our wide beam transducer is not going to be affected by that. It's going to shoot on the other side of the boat just like an omnio directional sonar would. It's going to do some amazing things without having to. Um, put a full 360 degree sonar on the boat protractor I'll check that out okay what's uh, what's different about this one we have uh, as I said we have two mounting bolts it comes with these shipped in there but you can see that's not thick enough to go through any hull so if you check down in the packing material you're gonna find some long bolts like this it's called all thread and that's plenty thick enough to uh, put through the hole and then cut it off with your your grinding wheel 
This also uses um, quite a bit different where this has a seal here and a nut that comes down over the top. Basically, you, you've cut this through hole at an angle. Everybody knows that. And you get it when those angles are matched up. They'll uh, uh, give you a level surface to then mount your bolt nice and flat. And that then takes the hull shape, which that's backwards in this case. Uh, let's turn this around and I'll show you here. There we go. Okay, now we see a cross-sectional view of both this little fairing block and the bigger fairing block, and this is where your hull's sandwiched at the slope at the whole angle. And that's how you get it to go straight. And we use a protractor like this that gives us our angle really quick. And then these new fairing block one side comes with a flat edge and that flat edge goes really nice up against the saw guide on the table saw or the band saw depending on how thick it is we have some massive saws so our saws will go all the way through this but if you're in a smaller boat yard uh, uh, we're down here in Chula Vista we call ourselves San Diego boat yard but we have a lot of land down here, so we have space for really big saws and small saws. You could also cut this off with a band saw, but, and it will do a nice job. You'd have to have a throat clearance up to here. And, uh, but it, the band saw does get a little wobbly, so you end up with a little bit more of this. Whereas when you cut it through the table saw, it ends up to be, you know, like factory perfect edge. So uh, always nice having a big boat yard. We're gonna, we're uh, we're never, we're never too unappreciative of that fact. Uh, let's see here. So we we would then slide this through our saw. We would adjust our saw at the hull angle like this, and then it would end up cutting through there like that. We would split it, and now we know uh, roughly how long our bolts would have to be. And then we go in and we, uh, we have to use this, which is quite a bit different. This is one of the main differences of this transducer. This is a cable gland. And this one, as you see, has a stem and that's attached to the element. This one doesn't do that. It takes all of its mechanical properties from the two big, huge bolts which yes, they can be sheared off. You hit a big old log head up in Seattle or you come down on a well or whatever, yeah, you could knock this thing off. So there is a, always a chance of sinking on any transducer that you put in, especially one that's this big and sticks down. Also, this is limited to 25 knots or less. You can go faster, but if you go you know exceed 35 knots that's the absolute max once you exceed 35 knots you're basically voiding the warranty of this so then you would have to build a pocket in your hull and put this on the inside of the hull and that would be that would um, take away all the forces from outside it wouldn't get as much of a signal but it's uh, it's what's got to happen if you don't follow those recommendations then you're going to damage that thing so this, this cable gland then, unlike the other one which is attached and hard mounted in, this then just goes in that old hole like this. The cable then comes up in it, and then they send you this piece of foam here. You stick it in there, you drill a hole the size of the cable, you put the foam in there, you put it around the cable, and then when you put in your compression nut, right here and you put that down in there it's going to compress that foam and keep that water from coming up where that cable is 
Um, also, if you were to shear it off, the cable's just gonna get ripped off. It's not going to jerk it through all this. It's just gonna rip. The wires aren't that strong. And then that would also help hold any water from coming into the boat. I don't wanna scare you by coming up with all this water and sinking and all that. We're just talking about a transducer here, but we are penetrating the hull of your boat. So if you're watching the video this long, you obviously wanna do this right and, and think and act like a pro. And you gotta think of the worst case scenario out there in the water on the weakest day, the worst luck with the weakest crew member. So you got to design for that. And this is, uh, this is good stuff. This is the kind of stuff you should have on your boat. Anything less than this. Now, if you're a trailerable boat, you've got no option. You have to have a, what we call a transit mount transducer. They're significantly smaller and they're designed if they hit them, they pop up. And, uh, and it's, they're better because of the chirp and the wide beam parameters that they'll give you and the processing behind that. But come on, it's not going to sound like a symphony. And, and that symphony on that display is going to be shown in vivid color to give you more target information and help you differentiate between species, sizes of fish, bladder size, how many fish, how close to structure, all those things. And, uh, you know, in some cases, the blind can now see. Well, anyway, this is Greg Moore from Boatyard San Diego. I'm a yacht builder, marine engineer, but gosh, we've done electronics since the 70s. And uh, we're a Fruno dealer. We, that's our favorite brand, but uh, any brand will do. We just, why do we like Fruno? I don't know. I, it's Japanese, and I think that every little wire and terminal and connector and printed circuit board and hinge pin and uh, paint coating it's all done just a little bit more commercial rated whereas some of the other builders are more expensive in their product but yet building it more on a sort of a recreational scale with things the wires are smaller and things are more plasticky so um, and then for Uno, really you call them on something that's 10 years old they're not going to hang up on you they're they keep all those parts and manuals and all that. So it's just, uh, it's, you know, they're, they're good enough to where they don't even have to have West Marine sell their stuff. So that should say something. But give us a call. San Diego Boat Electric, Boatyard San Diego, Greg Moore, clear, April 23rd, 2020, amidst the COVID-19 virus lockdown. Well, the last time I talked, we were talking about the angle of the hull and cutting this, and we just did that. And I'm gonna show you how we did it. This thing starts out like a fairing block that's not cut. And then you determine the angle of your hull. In this particular case, we already had the angle because the old fairing block fit perfect. So we were able to protract that angle just off of the boat. This is the bottom half. And you can see it only gets sealed around here. The rest of this is just free floating. It has a pin right here to keep it from rotating. That's the old transducer. The new one has two pins, one here, one here. So you have to dry fit it, get it all together, and then drill those holes and let me show you how we did this cut. When you're trying to cut something this big on a bandsaw, the bandsaw blade will have a tendency to bend and warp and wobble. Won't be as good as a cut. If you have a fairing block about this wide, then you could do it on a bandsaw. But the table saws won't cut this thick, so we cut half at a time. And you can see even in this one, the blade didn't quite come up half. But it didn't matter. We took out enough material where there was only about an inch in the middle left and we were able to use the bandsaw for that. So you can see here this um, transducer comes with a flat part here and here and it's wider and that keeps it straight and floating especially when you can when you have the angle to where you can put that side on the 
on the fence of the table saw or the uh, band saw. So in this particular case, what we did was, was we just turned it around backwards. So we had the shape of the hole facing the blade. And then we basically just centered through the pass once. And then we pass all the way through and then you turn it over backwards. And then you make your other pass. Now you got two halves done. Now there's only a little section in the middle and you take that over to your bandsaw. You gotta set up a guide to where it's just at the right level and then run that bandsaw through there and get the last little one inch that the table saw's blade thickness. If you've got a 12 inch table saw, you can do it. But most people have 10 or, or less. Uh, even if you got a 15 table saw. Now we could, we have a, also a big radial arm saw and you could do it on that as well. From Boatyard San Diego, we'll see you in the next episode of installing high power transducers. Okay, this is where the old transducer came off. You can see the outline of it. And there was no way to get this off without using, I told you the method we used was a long sawzall blade. We put a board over here. We had the blade bend over. We bent the blade over this way. So that means the highest point is gonna be kind of right down the middle. And you can see right here, there's a little bit of hole scraping that had to occur here. So we just fill that sand and fill that just normal exterior hull repair. That's nothing. As a matter of fact, it just went down a little past the primer. So, but the real thing here is now we have a foam core. Chances are you've had to take out a transducer to put this in. If it's a brand new boat, you won't have to worry about this, except if you have a foam core like this one, you can't do that. So what we have to do, and the reason is, is because there's a gland here that clamps around the cable. It's not like it has a bronze stem that goes up through here. It uses a hole here and a hole here to hold the whole thing on. There's nothing holding, or there is no stem at all. There's just the cable. So they put a cable gland here with a bunch of fasteners and rubber washers inside. And when you tighten it, it blocks the water from coming up. So because it has to squeeze down, it can't squeeze down on a foam core. So we're actually gonna drill a hole much bigger than the stem. And then we're gonna fill the whole thing up with resin and, and chopped fiberglass. And that will seal this whole foam core so that we get no leaking into the foam and we have no ability to compress it when we tighten this thing down. And then after that's filled and cured, then we'll drill another smaller hole, which will equal the outside diameter of the uh, cable gland. And then we don't have to fare the cable gland, like the transducer has to be fared to go straight. It's all hollow on the inside of the fairing block, so the cable gland will just fit up flat there. It'll be at an angle inside the inner hole of the fairing block. Here's a drawing of what we're doing, a cross-sectional view where on one side sort of offset towards the front is the stuffing tube and then the fairing blocks themselves are held together with the nuts here and the nuts here and then the rods stick down further and the transducer slips over the rods and then bolts on the bottom of here that's how it's held on you can see in this diagram right here now you can see and I had showed you guys some foam before and I mistakenly thought that this foam here was what would go into the stuffing tube and it's it's not it's a series of offset washers that when you rotate them that will keep the water from coming through this foam thing yes in the beginning of the video that I showed you would be the stuffing tube actually gets cut and put in the bottom hole where the bolt that holds this on is and then to show you a side view, 
Remember how I said you don't have to point that cable gland through? This is a view looking from the front. So the cable just comes up, goes in the hollow cavity, goes through the gland, and into the boat. This is the hull surface, and this is the part that we've cut at an angle to match the, the whole dead rise. Look at the cable, how there is no stem. And it just will sit in the middle of this cavity here. And the bolts themselves, the bolts that go through here and the bolts go through back there, that's what holds the transducer on. This big 60 foot power boat, even though it goes really fast, we're gonna classify it as a displacement hull. And we're going to mount the transducer about one third of the way back. And it's preferred that it mount on the starboard side it has to do with the cavitational noise that comes off of the propellers and their counter rotation but it's a minor thing in this particular case it's impossible for us to put a transducer that big where we need to put it on the port side of the on the starboard side of the boat so we're just going to keep this on the port side it's one of the more minor issues that they would like for you to do if you have a preference always put it on the starboard side well, I don't mean if you have a preference, meaning that if you, if your hull will lend itself to putting it on the starboard side. Okay, we're back on the bottom here. We're pulling off this plastic we used to seal this. And you can see this, we filled this up with resin and mishmash. And put in a slow amount of re uh, hardener. And we sealed this off. And we filled it from the top. Now we know that we have solid fiberglass. So when we tighten up that compression nut and the through hole nut, that we know we're not trying to collapse the outer skin and the inner skin. Therefore, when they collapse, it becomes like an oval and then it could leak. Also, this makes it a lot stronger if there were to be a catastrophic accident and this would be sheared off. We're gonna have the minimal amount of excess play here and we're going to end up with a beautiful new surface when we re-drill this for the 5200 to stick to rather than old dirty foam. So it turns out that this front hole from the other transducer can work in this application. So we've dry fitted one bolt and we've dry fitted the gland so we know everything's going to work. So now we've, it's not even dry yet, we've rough filled all this in roughly with one coat. See we still have some low depressions there. So we'll come back, we'll fill this up, fill this up, fill this up until it's smooth with resin. And then we'll sand it all perfectly baby smooth. And then we'll mount the transducer. The hull prep, you can't leak. You got to spend the time on the hull prep because if you have to put the boat in the water, then find out you have a small leak, a drip, drip, drip over a week or whatever, that's too much. So the boat then would have to be pulled out of the water and that's going to be expensive. Okay, we're back to the bottom of the hull. What we've done here, we've stepped one step farther. We've done some preliminary sealing of the uh, where the saw cut the old one off and we'll layer that up it's Still tacky right now as it dries. We'll add more and more and more of resin and mismatch and uh, This was sealed with plastic and we filled that with resin and mishmash and that's hard as a rock uh, Same thing here. Just a little patchwork turns out this hole for the old transducer will fit the new one and it turns out that the space between here and and here is adequate so we'll only be doing one hole so we're going to get the whole thing completely assembled including this on and including the transducer on before we even drill this very last hole and now that this is completely full and rock hard that foam on the inside now is encapsulated with resin so we'll drill a hole bigger than the stem of the cable gland big enough so only big enough so it could handle some new 5200 on the side of the nice new glass 
You don't want to try to put 5200 on the side of foam when you have a foam core boat, and most big sport fishers are. So you go ask an electronic shop, I want a fish finder, how much to install it. They tell you X. They're not going to do all this. You need to supervise, make sure that the hull work or the boat yard that's being done at has their yard manager looking at it to make sure the integrity of this work here meets hull standards as opposed to an electronics shop's hull standards. Usually they'll just drill it and put it in there and or a guy sells a boat and he's got a whole package on there. He's going for the lowest bidder. So you got to watch those things. All right, now we've put on the final layer of uh, fiberglass, resin, fillers. These are hard, durable products. There's no fairing compound in there. We're not interested in fairing it. We'll sand these hard resin fibers smooth and then we'll primer it put some bottom paint on it even though the transducer is going to cover all that so you could just hide that nobody would ever know but we would know it's just not what you do that's called gun decking so we're going to finish this whole bottom surface off sand it smooth like pros okay now it's time to drill the hole and the key here is is you want to sort of start the drill at the same angle as the hole first. You're going to want to drill straight so it faces straight down. But that's a, that's a normal through hole. And in order to, to drill straight down, you start like this and then you move the drill like this and then you go straight up. However, these big transducer has a cable gland it doesn't have a through hole stem so we don't have to worry about a more much more difficult cut of going at this straight angle and most boat yards won't know that they're conditioned and programmed unless they read the manual on this specific transducer to to make them go straight and then you would need another fairing block for the cable gland and that's just not necessary in this configuration. So we're going to keep our drill at the same angle as the hull and we're drilling our cable gland hole. All right, at this point, okay, stop. Okay, now start rotating it. We've got everything fully caulked and cleaned and flattened. We have caulking, slow down, go real slow. We have caulking in between the gasket and the through hole head and we have caulking well which is 5200 black we have that up on the top surface the top surface is grinded and cleaned and then acetoned and then we use more 5200 on the top in between a gasket on the top and then the flange nut Okay. I think it is. Yeah, that's it. And you see how it oozes out the side there? That's how you know you're getting funny out. Push real hard right here. Make sure you get enough out. All right. It takes acetone to do the cleanup. There's no other way. You don't want to get this stuff on your clothes or your hands. It doesn't come off very easy. Now on the top, Chris, he's got the nut and the stem of the through hole cable gland has a flat part on it and he has a big crescent wrench on that holding it. And he has a crow's foot socket a multi-point crow's foot socket and a three-quarter inch a three-quarter inch ratchet hold on hold on the whole thing's turning he has to hold the top I, I, I stop Chris? stop okay now he has to hold the top 
because the whole thing's spinning. Okay, we've, uh, they didn't have the wrench to hold the whole stem and that's why it started turning. So we stopped. It's very important to do this right. You don't want to pull the bow back out of the water. And we lowered it again so that we, move your hand for a second so we can see some light there, Danny. And uh, we lowered it again. We filled that pocket back up again. You don't want to take any chances at this stage that you're going to have a leak. So now when he sucks that up there, that stuff's going to ooze out all the way around because I didn't really see it ooze the way I like. And that's why you have three guys, one inside, one down, and one supervision. You don't want to just trust this job to anybody. It's any water gets in between those fiberglass inner and outer shell will get into the foam and run the boat. It will destroy it. So, uh, and you don't want a, new, a little drip, drip, drip. You know, even if it's one drop a week, that's too much. Okay, we added tape on the inside of the stem and uh, that'll aid in the cleanup because inside will be f uh, washers and they'll, uh, the top nut will compress them and uh, the cable will run up through the center. So we don't want a bunch of 5200 in that, that center area. But you can see it's pretty much done. It's oozing out the corner a little bit. We'll clean that up. But uh, that'll be on the inside of the fairing block, which staff, it doesn't matter. This doesn't have to point straight down, as I mentioned. Um, it's. Uh... Okay, we're in position now. We've got the threaded rod marked four inches down on each side. And we have our bolts screwed four inches up. That'll give us room to put the transducer on. We have a bunch of caulking on the threaded rod inside the fairing block and enough to go up through the hull. We have a guy up top with his own caulking gun and the other side of this. And let's see if we can put it in there. Yanni? You may have to do one at a time. Push the block all the way up first. Okay, that's gonna work. That's good alignment. Nice alignment, guys. Yanni? Okay, time to put the cable in. We're going, we're going in through a nice, clean, new construction bilge. So we don't have to really worry about capping these wires. If you're going through anything dirty, yeah, I would go ahead and seal all these wires. But we can do that when we start to pull the wires through the whole boat. Danny, what does he have? The nut on the top? Why isn't the cable coming? Danny, up? no está pasando el cable, que show. Okay, so we'll pull all this cable up now. Sure to go on. We have the rods measured out, what so the? that should be adequate. Just get one washer on there first and one nut, and then we'll put the sealant on the other side and then come back to the other one. The cable towards the back. But there's a little silver tab on the bottom, which is a temperature sensor. That has to go towards the rear. All right, at this step, what we're doing is we've drilled out the holes for the rods that hold the fairing block to the hull and seal and we filled that with epoxy putty all the way up to the top and we're going to let that dry and then we're going to drill again that's slightly larger than the rod diameter and when we drill again that will be the rod diameter and now we'll have a nice clean epoxy hole 
no chance for the foam to get damaged from any kind of water penetration. Extra step, but the way it should be done. And here we are with the final assembly. We've just sandwiched everything together. And now we're putting on the transducer. It's 25 uh, inch pounds, or foot pounds. I don't know, I've checked that spec. But nonetheless, it is only plastic, so you don't want to just sit here and torque real hard on it, and you have to go back and forth a little bit at a time. That's about enough there, Danny. Keep going back here. Back and forth, back and forth. Not too hard. That's about it. No, 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 that's enough. The other side? You know, we don't want to crack it. Okay. Okay, well, let's get a torque wrench now. And uh, it says here, no, there's not a torque spec here. We'll find a torque spec. We'll get it torqued. Okay, we're looking at the specs now. Even though we've been doing this for 42 years, we still read the instructions. Right here, tighten it first to 10 foot pounds, then to 20 foot pounds. He probably went more like to about 12 the way I was watching him. So we'll come in here with 20 next. And as it says, do not over tighten as it may crack the transducer or crush the fairing. So be careful. And on these big through holes, now you can see we have sort of a gap here. And even though we had sufficient amount of, of 5200, it's only slightly oozing out so that's just a place for a bunch of barnacles and stuff to grow so we've taped up around the perimeter and we're going to bond that in and make it nice and smooth um, and you can see our top bead there nice and smooth that all oozed out perfectly and uh, no secondary oozing after we tighten up the bottom so no air bubbles Looking good. Okay, we've got our torque set for 20 foot pounds. This is the final torque. Hold that on the bolt there, Danny. There we go. foot-pounds back and front check double check okay, now we're plugging the holes we have 5200 up there covering the top of the nut and the rod and we've pushed that in all the way and now pulled it back a little bit and we're cutting it that will leave when he pushes that back in that will leave plenty more space above it now you're going to pull that back down and cut more off. That's why you have supervision. you got to watch every move. Pull that back down and cut another three-eighths of an inch off that, Danny. Yep. 